What do you get when you strap jet engines to a seaplane and send it hydroskipping across the ocean? In the 1950s, the U.S. Navy found out with a supersonic fighter on water skis. And believe me, it got weird fast. I'm Bill, and this is Buffalo Air Park. Let's dive in. Imagine it's the early 1950s. Supersonic jets are the hot new thing, but the Navy stuck with a problem. These jets need long runways and come in hot during landings, neither of which plays well with an aircraft carrier. So, what's the solution? Enter Convair. Those same bold minds behind the Delta-winged XF-92 and the B-58 Hustler who pitched an idea straight out of a retro, futuristic comic book, build a supersonic jet fighter that takes off and lands on water. And to make that happen, water skis. Seriously? That wild concept became the Convair F2Y Sea Dart, the only seaplane in history to break the sound barrier. Now, let's talk design. The Sea Dart wasn't just some float plane with afterburners. It had a sleek delta wing profile, a watertight hull divided into multiple compartments, and high-mounted air intakes to keep salt water out of the engines, at least in theory. Turns out those engines still inhaled their fair share of salty mist, especially at low speeds and in crosswinds, so Convair added a freshwater injection system to rinse the engine internals. Because who doesn't want their jet to gargle before takeoff? And those skis? Retractable hydro skis. They'd stay tucked into the hull until the plane hit about 10 miles per hour during its takeoff run, then snap down and lift the fuselage clear of the water once enough speed was built up. For land-based handling, each ski had a small wheel, plus a swiveling tail wheel so it could taxi onto a seaplane ramp under its own power. But don't get too excited. It couldn't actually operate from a regular runway. Cockpit visibility? Well, let's just say, it was more submarine than supersonic. The pilot looked out through two oval panels set in a heavy metal frame, and visibility was described generously as limited. Still, the Navy was excited enough to order 12 production aircraft before the prototype had even flown. It was supposed to be armed with four 20mm cannons and folding fin rockets, but none ever carried weapons. None ever saw service. The first prototype, the XF-2Y-1, didn't even get the engines it was designed for. The intended J-46 turbojets weren't ready, so Convair installed the weaker J-34s, giving it less than half the planned thrust. The first flight, in January 1953, was really just a surprise hop during a high-speed taxi run on San Diego Bay. The official maiden flight came a few months later. Then came the skis again. Twin skis takeoffs were violent. One pilot described it like flying a tuning fork that beat you up with brutal vibration. A single ski prototype fared better and even performed well enough in rough seas, but the twin skis remained standard. In one test flight, Pilot Billy Long landed in level 5 seas, waves nearly 10 feet high, and slammed down so hard he broke his nose on the canopy. This plane was not for the faint of heart. But here's the wildest part. On August 3rd, 1954, Convair test pilot Charles Richborg took the sea dart into a shallow dive from 34,000 feet and broke the sound barrier. That makes it the only seaplane in history to go supersonic. Not bad for a flying boat on skis. Still, it wasn't all smooth sailing. The sea dart couldn't reach those speeds in level flight due to poor aerodynamics. 
It was designed before the area rule fuselage shaping became standard. A more refined version, the F2Y2, was planned but never built. Then came tragedy. On November 4, 1954, during a public demonstration for Navy brass and reporters, Rich Borg's sea dart broke apart midair, crashing into San Diego Bay and killing him. The crash was blamed on exceeding the airframe's limits, but it was a very public and very deadly blow to the program's credibility. By then, the Navy was already shifting away from the concept. Supercarriers like the USS Forrestal were solving the problem the Sea Dart was built for. The idea of waterborne jets faded fast. And just when you thought this story couldn't get any stranger, there was a proposal in the 1950s for a submarine aircraft carrier carrying three Sea Darts. They'd be stashed inside pressure chambers and raised by an elevator through the hull. Thankfully, that idea never got off the napkin it was sketched on. The Sea Dart program was officially canceled in 1957. Twelve were ordered. Only five were built. Only three ever flew. But here's a fun little footnote. Because at least one airframe remained in storage until the early 1960s, it got a posthumous re-designation under the new tri-service system, becoming the YF-7A. It never flew again, but it got a shiny new name, thanks to a nostalgic clerk somewhere in the Pentagon. Today, all four surviving sea darts are preserved in museums across the U.S., including one at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, perched on a pylon like a gate guardian. Though it never reached its full potential, the sea dart pushed boundaries, supersonic speeds, delta wings, and the wild idea that maybe a jet fighter didn't need a runway at all. It was loud, bumpy, high maintenance, and unforgettable.